Good evening. I'm Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Conversations with Selwyn. Thank you for joining us this evening. Those of you who are joining us for the first time, a very special thank you. CWS is about having conversations with people about their journey and how they're using their gifts and talents to help others. See, I believe that each of us has a story to tell and it is very important for us to share those stories. And I say that with this in mind. Imagine you are successful, but en route to that success, you have experienced many challenges. You fell down many times and you got up. And imagine telling that story and there's a young person somewhere in the world listening to you and recognizing similar challenges and being inspired to step beyond their limitations, to step beyond their challenges and become something greater than they expected. The interesting thing about this is that we can never know what one word, one phrase can do for so to transform someone's life. Imagine that person one day becoming the head of state or someone who discovers a vaccine that saves millions of lives or stops a genocide, perhaps a geneticist or oncologist, perhaps as our guest tonight, a very capable mathematician that can change lives by the way he teaches. Imagine that. And so I ask you, with that, whenever you have an idea, to commit to that idea, believe in your idea, because the success of that idea has nothing to do with you. Yes, you can indulge the glory and the joy from it, but I think our success represents a beacon of light that illuminates not only us, but those around us, reminding them that they too can shine, perhaps even shining on a spot to show them where their switches are. I think when we do for others without expectations, when we give to others without expecting them to give back to us in return, I think that is the true essence of our humanity, to give beyond expectation. And when I say that, I think about some great leaders who have gone before us, like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, etc., who have made ultimate sacrifices without even stopping to think, will I be around to see the extent or the fulfillment of my sacrifice? That, to me, is the ultimate gift. So who are you to commit to your idea? Who are you not to? Who are you to allow yourself to be mocked when, some, when you have an idea that sounds strange to others? Who are you not to? Imagine this medium through which we are communicating tonight. Imagine this is an amalgamation of many different technologies. Just imagine if one of these persons had decided, you know what, the guys are laughing at me, they're mocking me. I'm not going to create an iPad. I'm not going to create a particular piece of technology to work on the internet. Imagine that. Imagine our lives today without Facebook where we congregate, it's the new digital marketplace, where we congregate and we share information. We, I, sometimes I call it a digital couch, without which many of us probably would have lost our way because we don't care if anyone is really listening or paying attention, we get it out. The point I'm saying all this without trying to dilute the, 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 the seriousness of this whole matter is that your idea, when an idea selects one of us, the idea somehow knows that we have it within us to fulfill it. Sometimes you are given an idea and you ask, why me? How could the creator choose me to do this? They will laugh me, they will mock me. I went through that today because I stuck it out. I'm able to invite our friend, one of the sons of our soil, to come on and share his journey with us. And I'm looking forward to a very informative, a very enriching conversation with Dr. Terence Amiga Blackman. I'll take a break and when I return, I'll introduce to you our brother and gem of Guyana soil.
We are back. For those of you now joining, I am Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Conversations with Selwyn. The gentleman next to me, distinguished gentleman rather, is Dr. Terence Amiga Blackman. Terence, how are you tonight? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome, my brother. I, I want to just read a little bit of your bio and then we'll get started. Dr. Terence Richard Blackman is a, no, a, a number theorist, theorist and a mathematics educator. He is assistant professor of mathematics and mathematics education in the Morgridge College of Education at the University of Denver. His primary responsibility at Morgridge is to develop content courses in mathematics that prepare prospective K-12 teachers to be able to meet the new and rigorous mathematics standards specified in the Common Core State Standard, CCSS, and to participate in the development of a doctoral program in mathematics education that emphasizes research in both mathematics and mathematics education. He earned his doctorate in mathematics at the Graduate School of City University of New York. Prior to coming to the University of Denver, Dr. Blackman was as a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. visiting assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, where in addition to his research, he taught the freshman calculus class. He is a founding faculty member of the undergraduate program of mathematic, in mathematics at Medgar Evers College. He has 20 years of experience teaching undergraduate with an emphasis on number theory and the calculus sequence. He has created and directed numerous summer research projects in mathematics, and he is the founder of the Medgar Evers College Math Society. He works in aspects of the Jacques Langlands correspondence in the Langlands group program and on increasing the participation of African Americans in mathematics and the sciences. His research is focused on developing and implementing concrete strategies that support meaningful access to mathematics for underrepresented, underrepresented students and on the use of number theory in the teaching and learning of mathematics. He is co-founder and director of the Frank Raglan Math Masters Institute an initiative designed to engage middle school students in central Brooklyn in the development of their mathematical interests and talents. Doc, wonderful. Let me go straight into it. What was it like growing up in Guyana? Uh, it, was, it was a wonderful thing. Uh, and I think it, in large part, it sort of informed uh, what I'm doing today as, as I mean, I, I grew up, I, I was born in 1968, and, grew up for, in some sense, very real sense, personality was formed in 3rd Street, Alexander Village for, I don't know if many of your listeners would know where this is. My roots are in two places. They're in the Pomeroon and, uh, and they're also in Durban Street and Lodge. So, uh, Guyana informs who I am today in, in no uncertain way. And certainly my 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 roots in 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 Alexander Village, I think, uh, inform in large part who I am today. So so, you know, Guyana is is and was a wonderful place, and uh, you know, it, it, it informs in large measure who I am today. But I must say that uh, I have lived more of my life in the United States than I have in Guyana. So. <laughs> I'm hoping that uh, <laughs> so I, I'm now slowly have, I've become sort of, you know, a fusion person of Guyanese and 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 American sort of influences. So let let, let me let me try this. I'm going to ask you about three stages in your life. Yes. So give us a glimpse, if you may, of the nine-year-old Terence, the fifteen-year-old Terence, and then who he became at twenty-one. Uh, so the nine-year-old Terrence, uh, I would say, was in fourth standard at Central. I went to Central Primary School. And so as a nine-year-old at Central, I was a fairly precocious young man and uh, enjoyed sports, acrobatics, the whole thing, but also enjoyed fairly doing fairly well at school. And I think uh, that might have been the year when we, when we did the common entrance exam and you know, I was fortunate to earn a place at Queens College, and uh, so so the nine-year-old became sort of the ten-year-old at Queens College, and you know, 1979. Uh, that's when we entered 
uh, 1A in 1979. I still remember the list of people, Abrams, Alexander, Ali, Ali, Baptiste, Blackman, Mbozi, Matthews, Prasad. These are, these are very, very, very important people in my life. Uh, and I think Queen's College, in some sense, was the first kind of intellectual awakening. It was a, it was a wonderful, strangely, you mentioned MIT in the introduction. I think that Queen's College and MIT are perhaps places that are very, very similar, and people quite often don't, probably would not appreciate that, mm -hmm. who have not had the experience in both Queen's College and MIT. But broadly speaking, before I knew it, uh, Queen's College was like MIT, first form, athletics, sports, uh, again, the intellectual challenges, always there. Uh, at 15, sort of starting to think about mathematics in a much more serious way, I, you know, I was a good student in addition to being a fairly, a fairly decent sports person. Uh, I think at 15, we, we took our ordinary level exams and, you know, did fairly well. And that led to sort of the advanced level exams that are traditionally a part of the English sort of high school or former English high school cans. Uh, did fairly well on those also and sort of worked for a small bit slightly after high school, spent a, a, spent a year or so working at the Ghana Airways uh, Cooperation, which no longer exists, I think. Uh, that was also another extremely formative experience. Uh, a number of my mentors, even today, uh, are, are, were individuals who mentored me as a young man at the Ghana Airways Cooperation. Two people in particular I can think about at this moment, certainly John Campbell and uh, Floyd Fraser, uh, two gentlemen who, who were older than me, but certainly took a keen interest in, 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 in my development as a young man. They were both classmates of mine, by the way. Ah, they were. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you, you're in good company. <laughs> uh, these are these are two quality gentlemen who uh, who have, over the course of my life, uh, you know, been very, very, very offered me guidance in, in in ways that. So the 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 twenty year twenty one year old uh, Terrence Blackman was, someone who would internalize some of the, the wisdom of Floyd Fraser and John Campbell and, Fitzgeorge and. A few of the folks who were part of the Guiana Airways Cooperation, uh, and who had internalized sort of the lessons of Queen's College in in some substantive ways, and who had imbibed sort of the lessons of Central Primary, and uh, who was ready to who was ready to do some interesting things at at, at Brooklyn College, where he where where he found himself uh, uh, some years later. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And so, so you were going to say something else? No, I, okay. I, I, I thought I'd wait until you. Okay. Yeah. It's a hot day. I'm giving you a, a hypothetical situation. It's a, a very hot day. And you're looking for a cool place to relax, read, sip your favorite drink, and listen to some music. What drink will you be sipping? What will you be listening to? And what will you be reading? Uh, well, <laughs> that's a difficult question. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, 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 well, you know, my, my favorite drink, I mean, I, I, I like beer. I mean, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not an excessive drinker, but whenever I have an opportunity, I, you know, I enjoy, I enjoy a cold beer. And, you know, if I, if I think about places that I like to sit quietly, I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of bookstores. Mm -hmm. And so there are many, many, many wonderful bookstores and libraries that are spread across the world that I've had a chance to go into. Certainly in New York, I, I, I enjoyed very much going to the library uh, at 42nd Street. Uh, in Guyana, I enjoyed very much going to the library at uh, the, the sort of, well, actually, the, the first library, it's a good, good question. There is a library that is very, very close to my heart. Uh, it's the place that I, I always think of very fondly. It's the Festival City Library in the community where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And it is a place that I spent many, many, many hours. I think perhaps, I don't know if the library card is there still, but I probably read most of the books in the adult and children section in that <laughs> library. And uh, it's been one of my, 
it's been one of the things that I've tried to do over the course of many years to find ways to support that library. So, so certainly libraries of all stripes. I mean, I, I can't, I can't identify a particular place. Libraries and bookstores are places that I, that I find comfort in. So, for example, here in Denver, there's a wonderful bookstore called the Tattered Cover, and every time someone visits, I take them to this place, and and they too find it quite enjoyable. Uh, yeah, so beers and bookstores are, 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 are things that I that I that I that I think of fondly. Uh, now, where would I want to do this? Uh, no, no. What 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 kind of music will you be listening to? Ah, uh, well, I, I'm I'm a big fan of of of, of jazz, of you know, contemporary, you know, contemporary jazz. So so certainly, one album that I that I listened to a whole lot recently now I'm, I'm 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 blanking the guy's name is called etienne charles etienne and charles it's, yeah mm -hmm. it's uh he's uh I, I, he, he's definitely of caribbean roots i'm not sure what his but his is a kind of a real fusion i think of it as a kind of it's it, it sort of it's an ode to the kind of old calypsonians but it also sort of is an ode to uh, contemporary jazz musicians and old jazz musicians, and but but it does something that is completely new. So certainly Etienne Charles is someone who's a favorite. Uh, Lauren Hill is a favorite. Not some of the new things, but maybe some of the older things. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think my my deepest favorite is Bob Marley. So, oh yes. So I you know if you find me listening to music alone, invariably it will involve it will involve. It will involve Bob Marley. Mm. And, um, yeah, you mentioned mentors. You mentioned Floyd and, and John, as I mentioned, two friends of mine as well. D do you recall any special words of wisdom that that you received from your parents that have shaped who you are today? Ah, well, well, you know, like I said at the beginning, it's 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 my 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 world starts in in. Third Street in Alexander Village, and you know my parents are central. My my mother has a school teacher for almost forty years. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was a land surveyor, and then when family moved to family moved to New York, he became a nurse. He went back to school and studied and became a nurse. Uh, so you know my parents are my parents are central to you know who I am. Uh, you know my you know they they live a life of meaning. So, mm -hmm. you know, they, they don't offer advice by way of a word or two. I mean, my father has been a rock for as long as he's been my father. My, you know, my mother similarly so. So they live by example. They're not, you know, they're not people to give special words. They show up every day and right. they clear that there's a job to be done and you put your shoulder to the wheel and you, you know, you do your part and, and and that's their expectation, and that's kind of the way in which I've conducted things. If if, if I'm gonna I'm gonna try this here. If if you were to eavesdrop a conversation, the two of them talking about you, what what do you think either one of them would say? <laughs> what story you think? One well, I, I, I think you know look, my my mother is like me. She she hates raggedy. Oh. This is a word that I've been picking up recently. <laughs> the point is, she hates sloppy, and she tries to do things really, really well. And so, you know, my mother would be pleased that I've done some decent things, but I think that she will be the first person to point out to me the number of things that, the number of shortcomings mm. uh, that, that, that are often very evident in many of the things that I do. And, and I, and I, and I, you know, with the deepest love, and and I think that that's that's the one thing that I, uh, my my mother in particular, has sort of given me the sense of the importance of doing it the right way and doing it in the best possible way, and not and not sort of settling for, you know, everyone thinks you're great, therefore you're great. I mean, you sort of know what you're doing, and you can always do it better. You know, so so if she were to give advice, she'd say, you can always be better tomorrow. Than you are today, mm. regardless of where you are today. So whatever I am today, in my mother's view, I think that I can be a better person tomorrow, and and I carry that with me. So I get up thinking, you know, bath, breakfast, prayer, and now, 
you know, what good is it that I can do today to make this thing a little better? Because that's the kind of ethic that, and I, and I, I don't only say that from my mother's perspective. I mean, she is the person who you asked this question about, but from the particular family's perspective, that the important thing is to kind of make yourself better tomorrow, make yourself a little better tomorrow than you were today on an ongoing basis. This is the way that you, this is the way that you really sort of live the life. And, and my father, I think, would, would offer sort of, you know, he, he would take this advice, but he, he I think, is, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's a little more willing to kind of in, in, uh, to take in the, the you know, he, he's, he's, a, he's a bit more willing to, to, to look at the fun side of the life. And uh, and so I think I've sort of adopted some of those things, but uh-huh. they're tempered in very much by the very very the very sort of serious nature of life that I think my mother understands. And I think that goes to why I I I, I, I talked about education and survival. My mother, when she she was a student at the at the West Rhinevelt School, which she later became a teacher. And I think many of the things that happened, say, for example, in West Rhinevelt, have roots in the kinds of things that my family was a part of in mm-hmm. Alexander Village. So, so one small thing, when my mother left, uh, at that point, just, just school, I mean, they started a school at their home in, 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 in Alexander Village. So, so they have always understood this connection between education properly understood and 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 our survival mm-hmm. and so there and so in 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 her way of thinking about the world this is an extremely serious thing and and so this has been communicated many 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 times you know what when, 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 this to me now and I suppose forever you you speak speak of your mom I'm th- I think of progress and I think of progression and so I'm going to ask you about mathematics when when did your when when did you realize you had an interest in it, and at what point? What was the trigger that led you into pursuing it as a career? Well, it's it's a it's a kind of long story, but I'll but I'll start here. So we talked about Queens College earlier. So in Queens College, one of the things that they did at the end of the first year was to was to put put all of the young boys and girls into different groups depending upon their particular abilities and subjects. And so in first form, going into second form, so 10 going into 11, uh, I was put into set two for mathematics. And my mother, bless her soul, uh, 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 you know, I I wanted to be a writer at that time. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would write the great Guyanese novel. Uh, (laughs) You know, I had many, you know, I certainly... Edgar Mitterholza and, and um, like I said, I read all the books in the Festival City Library, and so I was a big fan of Guyanese writers and things Guyanese, and I thought that, you know, my sojourn at Queen's College would end up with me being, you know, kind of modern-day Martin Carter or something of that sort. Uh, but she pointed out to me that that mathematics was extremely important, and she could not settle with me being in set two for mathematics. It was the only thing that was acceptable was set one. And she was at that time at the University of Guyana and had a friend whose name was Walterine Matthews. And so in some sense, Walterine Matthews is the person who's directly responsible for me being a mathematician today. Uh, She was a Sunday Adventist and she was a math student at the University of Guyana. And I would go to her house every Sunday, uh, starting from maybe first form through fourth form. I'd go to her house and, and she would reveal to me sort of the mysteries of the algebra. And, you know, by the time I got around to third form, I was in, I was in set one and, and I was one of the better math students at Queen's College, but I, I didn't really think of mathematics as as a career, so to speak. I mean, I just recognized that that was part of, as I mentioned earlier, the kind of competition that, the academic competition that was part of Queen's College, that, you know, the point was, you know, I wanted to be one of the best math people. I was capable of being one of the best math people, and so I was. Mm-hmm. And, but this is, I think, in large part, the fact that I I had this opportunity to work with uh, Walter and Matthews for 
a significant period of time during my second form and third form years. And so, so that sort of stood me in good stead for all throughout high school. And when I came to Brooklyn College, I, I, by way of John Campbell, who was also a student at Brooklyn College at the time that I arrived, uh, and I met him there once more, and he introduced me to the National Black Science Students Organization, of which he was a part. And I became, because of my expertise in mathematics, I became the academic coordinator of that group. And as part of my efforts in kind of being the academic coordinator, I attended a number of math classes as in an attempt to be in an attempt to be an effective servant of the community that I was a part of. Mm -hmm. And and so that exposed me to a large number of ideas mathematically. And, you know, I graduated. Again, I still wanted to be a writer at this moment. I graduated from Brooklyn College in, I think, 1991. And I majored in math in large part because because it allowed me to take many writing classes because I felt very comfortable in mathematics and I knew that I would be able to be successful in majoring in math and this would give me an opportunity to spend time in classes studying writing and studying poetry and doing that kind of thing. And, and, and you know, when I graduated in 91, the question then became, well, what do you do with math degree? And I left, you know, the thought was, it was the beginning of the, largest bull market in Western civilization. I sort of went to Wall Street and started working with a, a black firm on Wall Street and was extremely disillusioned by what I saw there in the early 1990s. I think many people have subsequently recognized the, you know, the, 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 the nature of the business of, of, of the Wall Street business. And while on leave, and, and this is precisely where I became a mathematician, while on leave from the, from the position in Wall Street, I worked in something called the Family College at Kingsborough Community College. I, I had worked at Kingsborough Community College while as an undergraduate. And the, the person who ran the workshop sort of said, you know, Terrence, we have a special grant to do something, which was to prepare a group of single parents on public assistance for the city university math exams. And, uh, you know, I did that. And there were, there were four or five people in that class. And one person failed. And, and she came to the office and she, she broke down. I mean, just completely broke down. And, and it was the first time in my life that I really recognized the connection between mathematics, you know, understanding how to do some very basic rudimentary things, and and its connection to people's lives, and 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 the fact that you couldn't add, if you couldn't add fractions in this particular society in which we live, whether or not adding fractions is important, I, I claim that it is, but the point is, if you can't do that then you can't earn the kinds of living that will help to support your family. And so she, she broke down, and for me, it seemed like having one of my aunts sit in my office and cry. And it was at that moment that I made the decision to go to graduate school and pursue the doctorate in mathematics. And, you know, my whole intent was to kind of work in mathematics in circumstances that would be directed at particularly the African-American community, but more broadly, folks who had been locked out of the, the intellectual pursuits in mathematics. Because, as I've just described, my experience on some level was similar, and I understood very clearly what Walter Reed Matthews had done for me in sort of opening up that world. And so, I guess, since perhaps the fall of 1992 or 1993, I've been on the journey to sort of... <laughs> open up that world for as many people as, as, I, as I possibly can. You know, Terrence, talk, talking about opening up that world, I, I want to, and, and I like to follow the flow in, 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 in my conversations. 
you talked about Walter, Walter and Matthew who helped you to move up from set two to set one. And you had this, you had this um, personal or, or this personal relationship or attention and it helped you tremendously. Let's, let's fast forward to our communities, the African-American communities, so to speak, and young people who are struggling with math. Before I go there, I want to ask you one particular question. When a lot of people hear the word math, fear seeps in and they par get paralyzed and so on. What do, you believe, what do you believe is wrong with the way most of us are introduced to math? I want you to answer that and then, I, then we'll go to that question of the community as to do you believe, having had that experience, that it is absolutely necessary for young children or, or young people to have the one-on-one -on -one or extra lessons in math? Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, so first off, the, the thing is, it's really crucial to understand that kind of mathematical sciences are part of everyday life. Mm -hmm. Uh, as you described in your introduction, you talked about the internet, and you talk about the, the way the inter the, the underlying the, the, the things that underlie the internet are mathematical ideas, and and so, you know, modern communication, what we're involved with, transportation, science, engineering, every last thing that we do somehow is undergirded by mathematics, and mm -hmm. so. People often think of mathematics as a kind of special thing, but it's really nothing in the sense that what do you do? So what do you do math? It, it, well, it is the business of thinking about things abstractly. So it, I, I, I think of it as, so, so, so reach for a Guyanese metaphor. I, as many, many young men like me, my uncles, uh, or they, you know, they went into the bush and they became miners, and so their whole job was to sort of unearth gold from. And so I think of mathematics as mining. So what am I doing? I'm mining the world of ideas. I'm thinking, here is a world of abstract ideas, and some of them have relationships between others that others have not seen, and to be able to unearth those relationships that are not immediately evident has some kind of currency. It's like someone being able to kind of find places where there, where there is gold in, in some sense. Ideas are gold. And, and so I think of mathematics as just a game of unearthing interesting ideas. And, and once you see it that way, then it becomes, well, how do, you, how do you do it? And the point that I try to explain is that we do this all of the time. I... I, I, I think people don't fully appreciate that they do mathematics. When you, you know, when you organize yourself in the day, you do mathematics. You're doing scheduling problems. You know, when you, when you pay your mortgages or you pay your bills or you're doing mathematics. So mathematics is a part of our lives. It's just that we don't see it. It's, it's sometimes hidden. When you dial the numbers to make a telephone call, well, what's happening? I mean, you, you punch these numbers in, 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 in you know, 718-859-something, uh, that thing gets converted into binary somewhere. It, it, that binary then triggers some electromagnetic wave which hits a satellite which hones in on something somewhere else. And I think that what we're missing is this connection. What our kids are missing is this connection between the things that they do all of the time. You talked about in your in your introduction, you talked about, you know, the use of the internet, the use of iPads, iPhones, etc. Uh, our, our kids use these tools, but they don't have any sense of what's underlying these tools. And we have not yet sort of provided the kind of infrastructure that allows for them to really dig in and understand what's going on. Our, our schools are not doing a good job, particularly in the United States, but, but I think increasingly in the Caribbean also, are not doing a good job of allowing kids to kind of dig in and see this connection between the life that is immediately around them. You know, you talked about Facebook and the, and the Internet. Uh, how does that work? Mm -hmm. And what are the algorithms that underlie? We, you know, we search for things in Google. Well, how does that work? What, what is the, how, how does it know what to look for? How does it do it? 
And I think those are the questions that our, our, our kids are not seeing. So, you know, when you ask what is mathematics, mathematics is what we do every day. Mm -hmm. We do it all the time. It's the kind of way in which we, the way in which we understand our world. It's this qualitative, it's this quantitative way in which we understand our world. And we do it, instinctively do it. And what we miss often is, is the connection between the instinct that we carry with us and what happens formally in our schools. I, as, as, and I want to ask you this question and then we'll take a quick break. As founder of quite a few math societies, what is the ultimate goal of all these efforts? Uh, well, well, see, see, the, here, here, so I'll, I'll say this in the following manner. So, mm -hmm. from the community perspective, uh, I'm, I'm being slightly provocative, but from a community perspective, one of the things that we think about is sort of economic empowerment. And and for a long time, I've I've said to to many of the folks who live in New York City uh, that. Brooklyn, New York sits, you can get on the number two or the number three or the number five train, and it will take you 30 minutes to get from Flatbush and Nostrand to, to Wall Street. And, and on Wall Street, the largest pool of money in the world passes through that place every single day. And that pool of money is accessed by mathematical tools. And so part of what I've been trying to do is to, on some deep level, uh, train as many young people to begin to think and begin to see that mathematics in the 21st century is the thing that empowers us in a substantive way. Uh, you, you, can, you, you, you talked about the Internet earlier, and everyone noted just recently the purchase of, of the company WhatsApp. WhatsApp, by, yeah. Mm -hmm. by by Facebook for close to, I think, nineteen billion dollars. The point is, uh, what I'm what what I'm really trying to communicate to as many people as possible is that you cannot you cannot access the world of genuine finance, the world of real finance, the world that allows communities to move in a substantive way without having the tools, the quantitative tools that you learn. In, 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 in sort of the mathematical world. And, and it's part of the challenge, I think, for myself and others of this particular generation to begin to build the kind of infrastructure in our communities that allows us to kind of train our young people to do that kind of job. Mm -hmm. and, and it's difficult, and it's not going to be something that, that, that I will be able to do in the course of my life. But part of what I want to do is to be able to show people in the same way that Walter E. Matthews showed me, uh, in, in the same way that many people subsequently have showed me, that it, the way to do it is by doing it. And the way to do it is by creating an infrastructure in which people can at least see themselves doing it and begin to attempt to do it. And, uh, you know, we, we, we can talk more about that. I don't want to go on. Well, I want you to think about this subject. When we get back, we'll go straight into it. What do you think is missing in the messaging to our communities regarding education, but more importantly, mathematics? We are back with Dr. Terence Blackman. Terence, the question I asked you before the break is, what do you think is missing in the messaging to our communities regarding education, but more importantly, mathematics? So, so I'll start with the, with the education component. I, I, think, I think what happens is that uh, what we've been saying is that too many of us sort of see education as essentially kind of preparation for a job, sort of moving up social status or you know kind of trying to get a better lifestyle and 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 and, and these are these are really important things but you see it's not the point of the game right so so you see this goes to our, our title so, so at the deepest level i think it's important to recognize that kind of education is about survival it's it's really about being able to 
ensure that our children can negotiate their space on the planet for an extended period of time. And I think that 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 message is is not kind of resonating with our uh, or we're not communicating as effectively as we can uh, that message to young boys and girls in our community. Uh, so that's the thing that I think that is missing. So first off, it, it's that sense that this education is important, but not just as a kind of as a proxy for jobs, as a proxy for it, it's important as a way of negotiating your place on the planet. It, you know, one of the things I would often say to the students in, uh, in, the, in, 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 in the class, and, and, they, and some, some would begin to understand me, was say, look, when you graduate, I want you to take that diploma and take it over to the store and see how much you're going to get for it. <laughs> and, and the point is, you're not going to get anything for it. Hmm. Right? See, it and, and so it's that way in which, the way in which things have been structured is that people imagine that having physically this piece of paper is important. And so what happens, what you find is that our kids then, our kids take lots of shortcuts. They don't take the time to learn the things that they need to learn. And so they find themselves with a piece of paper that says, I have a degree, I have a bachelor's degree in, in something, but it, but it is of no value because it, it, it has not provided them with skills. And it's only then that they recognize that really this game is really not about kind of the piece of paper, but it's 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 the journey that you engage in and the mm -hmm. kinds of challenges that you overcome in acquiring this piece of paper. And if you take shortcuts to acquiring this piece of paper, then 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 it doesn't work. So I think that that's part of at the deepest level, I think that that's what we want to begin to do. We want to begin to make clear to our children that 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 critical thinking and problem solving is a normal thing for them to do and it's important for them because not only will they get a job but it will be helpful in them being able to make the kinds of decisions that have to do with whether or not they stay on one side of the planet or on the other side mm -hmm. and I, I think that that's what's missing from our discussion quite often with our children and that's what's missing from our institutions that kind of strong sense of purpose attached to the education that we're giving to our children and I, and, I, and I say that not as not just not as a uh, not only as someone whose job it is to do that but I say that as a father uh, you know I have a son I say that as an uncle and and you know just today he and I are talking about his math and you know it's very difficult for me to convince him about kind of the energy that you need to bring but you know i understand he's he's a wonderful and smart and talented young man but i'm just to kind of get over that it, it's really really important that that you dig deeply in your resilient and 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 you push past the place that is just set for you i mean part of you know one of the questions that you sort of suggested to me well that you know the exams are a little harder than 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 the problem sets that the professor assigns, and I was trying to point out to him that the exams are always harder than the problem sets that the professor assigns, and 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 that's part of the challenge that you have. Mm -hmm. I think that the way you engage that challenge is by understanding that if you don't succeed at that challenge, that you are not going to succeed in a whole series of things. And I, you, you know, I. I I'm very, you know, for, I, I, I suppose I've, you've gotten me a bit worked up. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. It's your so, conversation. So I, should, I, should, I should back up. <laughs> One thing which I didn't say at the beginning, which I should say, you know, was that, you know, it's a real honor to kind of, kind of, you know, be here on, you know, talking with you. And, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I look, and I'm sure you know this. I mean, I, you know, you know, when one looks at the root of kind of like story, and you know, your 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 thing of telling the story, and you know, this root, at least in the Greek sense, it's sort of histor, mm -hmm. and, and and that means sort of one who's wise and learned. So I think you're wise and learned in sort of kind of creating this community for folks to be able to do this. And I I should have said that at the beginning, but uh, I, I got kind of carried away and. So my apologies, and I just wanted to. It it, show, it, show, it always shows up at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> the wisdom and the learnedness, and, and kind of allowing to, you know, allowing 
us to be able to tell these stories because mm. I think it's in these stories that we make meaning for ourselves and for our children and 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 I'm 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 really honored by the 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 opportunity to say to to to, to speak here. You're here. welcome. You're welcome. If I may go to the chat room for a second, Lydia said, "Looking forward to this conversation, Patrick." Good evening to you and Dr. Blackman. Enjoying the interview. Patrick, again, why did you choose the College Arena as the forum for reaching the people who are locked out from mathematics rather than maybe high school? Uh, so, 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 to Patrick, he's, he's right. I mean, I think, I think I chose the College Arena in large part because, uh, because that was the space in which the problem of practice emerged for me. So I was at Kingsborough Community College working in the family college, and this was the place at which the decision became, the decision was sort of at that point where it was something that was important. Uh, why not high school? Increasingly, and that's in some sense why I'm, why I'm here at the Mortgage College, because I've recognized that, that it, these problems don't only exist, so that the root of these problems are much lower. So in terms of the kinds of things that I've been doing, I suppose I've been, I've been sliding down the scale in some sense, trying to find a place at which I can really kind of plant the, you know, sort of really set the foundation up. And, you know, at this point, I've been thinking, and as you noted in the introduction, part of, part of what I've been doing, and this is as a result of a very thoughtful process. I've come to the place where I think, okay, the way that I can kind of have the maximum impact on, in, in terms of broader community is kind of target my efforts at teachers with the hope that those teachers then will go out and and kind of you know carry this message and i and i think we've had some success i mean one one thing you in this regard we which we alighted was you mentioned the beginning the frank raglan uh math circle that we started in brooklyn and you know this was started at uh, Medgar Evers College, and it's named Frank Raglan in honor of a, an African American mathematician named Frank Raglan, who died in 2011, who was a mentor of mine at Medgar Evers College, and he 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 was from Alabama, he's from Birmingham, Alabama, and he really kind of inculcated in me the sense of and gave me the tools to understand the sense of mathematics from an African American context. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, it was in his honor that we started. I mean, and we, we, we'd always had discussions about thinking about ways to kind of impact the middle school. And it was in his honor that we started the, the, the Math Masters Institute. And in its name, you can see what we're trying to do. We're trying to offer a certain kind of mastery of mathematics uh, for folks in young people in middle school in the sense because we recognized that you know coming in at first year college was kind of almost too late coming in in high school in some sense it's almost too late coming in in the middle school maybe we have a chance and so now we're we've been targeting some efforts at the middle school I mean I've been here working on developing some middle school activities related to I've been working in some middle schools also in New York uh, in, in, in Harlem and the Bronx, thinking about ways to bring a certain kind of thinking around mathematics to these spaces. So, so Patrick is right in some, in some very real sense. Uh, you know, we've also been doing the same kinds of, thinking about doing the same kinds of things in, in West Ocala, Florida, in a number of spaces. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, we, we, he, he's absolutely right. The, the point is that in order to be able to impact the African American community in a substantive way, we need to have a message that is targeted and that resonates at the the elementary school level, at the middle school level, at the high school level, at the college level, and and we need to be directing resources there. But but I just want to push back just a little bit on that to say that there is there is real value to having African Americans and Black folks of the entire diaspora participate in mathematics also at the highest level because one of the things that 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 i think is is often evident in certainly in the american context is that race plays a factor and so one can go to many many spaces and find very very few 
dark black and brown faces in mathematics departments, in departments of mathematics education across the United States and, 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 and across the world. And so I think it's, it's, it's extremely important not to just focus on one area. Mm -hmm. We have to kind of focus on all of the places where people participate in this activity and we have to have strategies that go to kind of finding ways to populate those places with people in that activity. Not, not simply to populate people so that someone is there saying, you know, I know how to do math, but that person can't do math. But to populate that place with people who can meaningfully participate in that enterprise. And that's part of what we've been trying to do from a research perspective and then also trying to do from a policy perspective. Carl, Carl asked, what is, that is, a, sorry, made a statement, that is a really abstract concept of education. How do you make it operational? the infrastructure doesn't support it well you have to create the infrastructure and, and 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 this is this is part of you have to create so so let me give you one small example so mm -hmm. I, I just mentioned the 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 frank raglan how did how did that come into being in i in 2011 i think april 2011 black history month uh the male development and empowerment center at medgar evers college under the leadership of of, of larry martin uh arranged a Black History Month program around science. And as part of that program, they took us, the scientists, into the community. And we spent some time at the church on, on Rogers and Eastern Parkway. Now I'm forgetting the name of the church. But we gave a reveal in the church about the importance of science and the importance of attaching educational endeavors to the church. And while some, someone in the audience, one of the parishioners, stood up and said, well, you know, let's say tomorrow, exactly the question Carl is raising, let's say tomorrow I wanted to send my son to a math camp rather than a basketball camp. Where would I send him? And we thought for a moment and realized that there was no place in central Brooklyn where a young man or woman who had an interest in mathematics could go on Saturday and do something that was outside of the usual school, uh, the formal school structure. And, 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 and we decided to create it. And so Larry Martin, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a rare move for, you know, we talked about leadership at some point, in a, in a, in a stroke of leadership, uh, said, you know, Terrence, if you think you can do this, it would be a good idea I will let I will try to find the sort of resources for you to put this together, and we put it together, and we've run it now successfully for about three years, and I think that that's what has to happen, and we have to do that in many, many, many communities. See, that infrastructure is not going to emerge magically. It, it it has to be something that is supported by the community in a substantive way. Uh, people have to sit down and and think how can we put together an after-school program here in this community? There are already existing institutions in our community, so churches are already there. Each church should have an educational thing attached to it that helps her children to do their homework problems, that, that, that sort of takes the, kind of creates a community around which high school kids can talk to middle school kids. You, you see, this is not something that is new for us. It's just that we have allowed this sort of infra we've allowed this infrastructure to 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 erode and we have not really thought seriously about how we reconstitute that infrastructure I i'll give one example in our in our discussions with folks in west ogala florida uh the question was you know what are the resources we discovered that one of the i, I think one of the very few African American women who earned a doctoral degree in mathematics at MIT turns out to be someone whose roots are in West Ocala, Florida. And the young kids who are in West have no idea that 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 this was and this has been a part of their tradition. Mm -hmm. And so part of what I'm saying is we're not aiming at we don't need to learn anything new of know how to do this. It's just a question of sort of summoning the will and the leadership that is necessary 
to reconstitute the kinds of things uh, that we know are useful that will guide our children to these places that we, 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 we recognize it's sort of important for them to be guided to. So, you know, so Carla's right. How do, you, how do you operationalize? And what I'm saying is that the way you operationalize is by understanding that there is no large plan for all of the communities across the United States, but in every community, there are a large number of people with a large, uh, my, 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 my friend, Bill Massey calls this the Superman syndrome. And so he, he often says the following, we, we tend to view ourselves as kind of super, like Superman. Note that Superman is the only person from his planet, Krypton, who is on Earth and has these superpowers. And, and you know, we never see any other people from Superman's planet. And whenever they show up, they're usually bad. And <laughs> Superman is starting to keep us away from them. And it would be... It would be interesting to figure out if we could see the whole planet of Krypton. And, and, and in some sense, that's the position that we're in. We have a vast talent in our communities. And what we, what we keep doing is we, we keep waiting for, for someone to show up to do it for us. And my, my view is that there is vast talents in Brooklyn, in Florida, in Denver, in all of the places, I mean, we're going to Mississippi in a few days. Uh, in Mississippi, there are many, many people with extreme talent. And the question for us is to figure out how to, how to bring together, how to network, how to be more intentional about what we're trying to do. And, 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 I, and I, I am very optimistic that we can do this. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've already seen the fruits of this optimism and seen what happens when we, when we, when we really are intentional about the education of our children. I think, you know, this for me, I think is, is this, it will be the defining sort of, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say civil rights because quite often I think civil rights is sometimes weak. It will be the defining sort of human rights issue mm -hmm. of, of our time, whether or not we can find ways to have people from the bottom quintile of our society have meaningful access to education what, in what, ways that will support them. What are some challenges you have uh, teaching math in, in, in our communities and what type of challenges do you anticipate uh, developing an infrastructure and implementing it? Well, well I, so, so there are two things. So let's say the, the mar large macro challenges. So there are two levels. So I suppose the largest challenge, and, and quite often my 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 uh, some of my friends, you know, they they think me, you know, never concerned with issues of race. So so the so I should say to get this out to the outset, the largest challenge in in certainly in the in the within the context of the United States is often kind of the way in which race works in the space of science and mathematics. So whether or not explicit or implicit. Because you go into spaces that are often not spaces in which one finds a large number of black people practicing mathematics, the, the, the sort of sense is that this is not something that black people ought to participate in. And, 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 so, and so to work against this is often very, it's very tiring. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so to constantly have to say to someone that you know, young people in central Brooklyn are of value and you ought to make every effort to provide the best possible education for them is, is, is it takes an immense amount of intellectual, spiritual energy to, to kind of maintain a certain zeal and intensity in, 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 in protecting the space in which the young people operate. So, so this overarching sort of narrative of you know, the sort of what, you know, for lack of a better word, the sort of the way in which the way in which the kind of the, the, the sense of the roles of white and black folks in areas of science, this narrative that is pervasive in our society, that I think is kind of the huge challenge. Underlying that challenge on the other side is also the challenge of the kind of leadership that is necessary in our own community. So quite often, you know, 
one can go into schools in 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 one can go into middle schools in in Brooklyn and find you know a computer room in which in which there are 30 computers in which only six of them are working or one finds schools in which you know the teachers are not doing the kind of job that they need to do and and everyone accepts that as kind of par for the course because everyone is thinking well maybe these kids are not going to go so far anyway so why should we invest the kind of energy and resources let's just keep everything quiet let's move everything forward and you know so so these things the overarching sort of quite narrative and then on the bottom level the way in which we for lack of a better word have internalized that narrative and have become less vocal and less intense about the opportunities that are there for our children and ensuring that those opportunities are the very best opportunities. Mm. So those are the two sort of like philosophical things that kind of shape the space. But then I also think that within this context, there are institutions that people deal with on a daily basis. And in these institutions, there are people. And, and, and these people have to act either A, in the best interest of, of young men and women who are there or to not act in the best interest of the young men and women who are there. And quite often, uh, I think it's been my experience that that our, our institutions and the people in those institutions uh, are not as are not as vocal or are not as 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 strongly committed as they ought to be in the interest in the interest of our young people. And mm -hmm. You know, we, we 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 talked about this prior to the interview. I, I think that this issue of leadership is extremely important, and this leadership at the level of the institutions in our community is extremely important. It really profoundly matters who runs the middle school in a community. Mm -hmm. It profoundly matters who the math teacher is. It profoundly matters, you know, who the who the principal is, who the janitor. Look. At Medgar Evers, I just said janitor, and I was just reminded. At Medgar Evers College, there was a janitor. I think his name was Mr. Boykin. Uh, he died a few years ago. Mr. Boykin was the he 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 was in large part responsible for the success of this math masters program. Why? At at every stage that you know we thought we would try to bring the kids to the college, and and so the question then became. You know who's going to look at them. Uh, you know maybe they're going to break stuff up. Uh, if we provided pizza, maybe they're going to mess everything up. And and Mr. Boykin, you know, he took me aside. He said, he said, Prof, don't worry about it. I'll take care of all the things that you need to take care of in this context. Hmm. I think that spirit is missing in 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 in. in I, I got extremely emotional on that front. But I, I think that spirit is missing. So our, our, our the people who are in our spaces in large part have 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 in, in, in some places given up on our children. Mm -hmm. So so schools run where the janitors and the public safety officers and, and all of these people, they're they're not as intense. They're not as as demanding and you know they're not like my mother mm -hmm. they're not demanding the absolute best for their children at every single time every single day at, in every single hour and i think that you know in between these big narratives of white supremacy and these other things there's this large space in which we have to act and i think that we have to recognize as individuals that we have the power to do that and and we don't have to wait for 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 Superman or Superwoman to walk up, there there are lots of people from that planet walking around. You are one of those people. I am one of those people. You know, the person who asked the question uh, is also one of those people who can who can create a small middle school uh, enrichment activity in mm -hmm. in who can who can organize you know trips to the museum. Who can who can do the kinds of things that our kids need to be done? It, it is it is it is I think I think completely unacceptable. I I I, I in I, I recently working on I've been working on a book on black mathematicians and their works, and I was looking at some research, and it turns out that in 
in 1968, uh, uh, black folks constituted about 11.5, 12% of the population. And, and they amounted for about 2% about of the students in graduate schools across the United States. 2010, 2014, this number is about 5%. Hmm. So I'm, you know, from 1968 when I was born to now 2014, 45 years later, we've gone from, from 2% to 5%. Maybe we've just doubled in 45 years. And, and that's unacceptable. And I think that our, 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 our leadership needs to say that that is unacceptable and needs to communicate that in, in, in no uncertain way to our communities that that is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once you've accepted that that is unacceptable, then you begin to ask in, in a very serious way, what concrete steps do we need to take in order to achieve particular kinds of outcomes? And that's what I've been, you know, that's what in some sense I've been trying to be about. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I got, I got. No, no, that's okay. I, no, remembering Mr. Boykin. Yeah, I mean that's what I mean. It, it, you know, you know, he he kept the thing clean. He he allowed me to do the kinds of things that I needed to do from a mathematical perspective, because I knew that as someone who was responsible for handling his side of the bargain, that he had the leadership capacity to take care of the things that he needed to take care of. And I think that that's what we're missing. Mm -hmm. It matters profoundly who. The leader of your janitorial crew is in a in a high school or a middle school so that it's clean so that it's aesthetically pleasing so that when you go in the kids understand that that is a special environment and i think we've lost that i've gone to many places where i where i where it's clear to me that you know the responsibility of the people on the inside needs to be and you can't blame that on someone else let me go in the chat room for a second um lynn did said are asked, have you ever met a young black person who really gave you pause because of their great math skills? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is what people don't understand. So, so here's a quick story. Uh, in, in the summer of 2011, we, we were started this math master's program at MS61 on, on Empire Boulevard in, in Empire Boulevard and New York Avenue in, in, in Central Brooklyn. And so my job was to sort of prepare the kinds of things that we were doing, and, and then there were other people who were working with us, and and other students, wonderful students, you know, whose names, you know, Chris Wellington, Andre Robinson. These are all extremely smart young men and women. Nikita Burgess, extremely smart. Uh, Chris Wellington, a very wonderful teacher. He's teaching this class, and there was a young boy in the class named Amari. And what I would do would be to kind of add something on the sheet that was kind of interesting, that would give me a sense of what people were thinking. Like, what, what's the level of the thinking? Are they just kind of doing things in a kind of rote algorithmic way, or is there some kind of mathematical creativity? So that's part of, that was part of what we were trying to elicit, kind of really get a sampling of what the mathematical creativity looked like in this space. And so this one particular day we gave we had a particular problem on the thing. It's called the isoparametric problem. What it what it argues, what it tells you, sort of, you know, if you fix the perimeter, what's the biggest area that you can enclose? And so, if you think about that for a while, you'll recognize very quickly that, you know, the square is the one that encloses the biggest perimeter. But then the other question would be, well, what sort of shapes? What would be outside of a square? You know, what other kinds of shapes would be shapes that you should consider? So at some point, Mr. Wellington says to me, Dr. Blackman, I want you to get Amari out of here. <laughs> He's disruptive. He's completely disruptive, right? And so I go get Amari, and I had a little office and a blackboard, and I said, well, you know, tell me what you're thinking. And, and so he starts, and, and then I realize I'm, I'm stunned. He's already figured out the basic problem, which I gave, which was basic, but it was harder than the usual ones that they had. Mm -hmm. He'd already figured that out, and he'd already gone on to thinking about this at a slightly more sophisticated level. And, and that struck me. And, and, I, and I'll tell you why that's important. Because Amari was among the first group of students who we started this program with. Of that group of students, there were three of them who earned places in the specialized high school. Amari was not one of the three of them. Hmm. He was clearly a smart. So, so the point is, we have vast talent among our students. We, we simply have been, you know, we, we're simply 
we're simply asking them to not, we're not challenging them in the way that they need to be challenged. You know, and, and it's, it's precisely, you know, Dr. Raglan would often say to me, he said, Terrence is exactly these smart kids like Amari who end up at Rikers Island. Because there's nothing in the classroom for them intellectually. Mm. And we, we have not configured our institution so that we can take advantage of the smart kids who are part of our institution. We, we always imagine that we don't have, and that's what I mean about this narrative of the way in which we perceive. We don't recognize that in these rooms, on the subway station, in, in these rooms, in Jackie Robinson Middle School, in, in, in MS-61, in you know, the Med Gravers, we don't recognize that these young men and women who sit in front of us carry in them genius. We, we think that it's somehow wrong to suggest that that these young people actually, and so then we don't treat them with the same kind. And what I'm saying is that, you know, the record is what it is. I have taught the freshman year class at MIT, and I have taught those students. And I don't think that the ones in Brooklyn are any less talented. I know that deeply, right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's why I'm optimistic. I know that deeply. And the question for us and for me is to communicate to people who are who are part of the leadership that they that they have to invest in our children in a substantive way, and 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 to the extent that they do that, they will see the returns. Tess in chat room asked, uh, "What can the field do to encourage more minority interest and participation?" Uh, what can the the field, I guess, the field of mathematics, do to encourage? Uh, well, you see, so 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 that's so. What can the field do? So my, my my sense is that you need to have an appropriate welcome, and 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 that appropriate welcome is often is often missing. That's why I'm working on, you know, things related to black mathematicians and their works because quite often, uh, this the larger mathematical sort of societies are not as welcoming. I mean, there is a history. I mean, you know. There is a long history of of exclusion of African Americans. I mean, you know, in this in this in this book that I'm reading, uh, in trying to prepare this stuff, you know, there, you know, it's a bit of history. Many of the African American mathematicians of an earlier era worked in historically black colleges in the South, and so the Mathematical Association of America and the American Mathematical Society, when these organizations had meetings in the South. Uh, these meetings are often held in places where, uh, just by rule, uh, many African Americans could not attend meetings. I mean, there, there's a long, you know, there's long correspondences between between individuals and the organizations. Who are some? Who are some of these um, black mathematicians you 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 can think of or you admire? Who are some of them? Uh, well, in the contemporary, so certainly, certainly in the contemporary sense, uh, I, th I think the foremost uh, African American mathematician is 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 uh, someone named William Massey, who is a who is a who is a who is a professor at Princeton in operations research. I mean, he's probably uh, he's probably the kind of leader of the pack. Uh, you know, there are many others. Uh, you know, Scott Williams, uh, who's who's someone who's done the the mathematicians of the African diaspora website. Uh, you know, there's uh, Donald King from, and there are also many younger people. So, you know, there are younger number theorists. There's a young woman uh, at, at, at MIT, and her name is Chelsea Walton. Yeah, the point is, the point is, uh, Bill Massey, for example, has something called the CARMS Conference. It's the Conference of African American Researchers in Mathematical Sciences. And every year in June, this June it will be held at Princeton, at least 100, 150 African American mathematicians gather. We're not that endangered. Right? There, there are a lot of us. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, just a, it's just that, you know, we're, we're sort of spread out and we're not as connected. And so part of the thing is to try to figure out how we can sort of make clear to our folks that we're here. We've been doing this. We can do this. We've done this for a long time. Uh, you know, historically, I think people often often go to Benjamin Banneker. Uh, 
you know, I can speak. There, there's a so in in 2012, I think it was. Uh, there is a there is a so the the National Association of Mathematicians, one of the African American mathematical organizations, uh, does something called the Clayton the Clayton Woodward Lectures, and so this honors sort of sort of earlier 1920s, 1930s African-American mathematicians, Clater and Woodward. Well, it turns out that, that Clater sort of published, I think, two papers in his life. And these two papers that Clater published are published in the Annals of Mathematics. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me say the following. The Annals of Mathematics is the journal at the very, very, very top of the field of mathematics. Most mathematicians will live and die without publishing a, few, a paper in the Annals. Clater, one of the very early African-American mathematicians, publishes only two papers in his life because he became kind of perhaps a bit disillusioned by all of this stuff. Both of those papers were good enough to be published in the Annals. So the point is, black folks have, are smart. They're genius in a number of ways. And, and, and that's kind of part of the record. The, the, issue, for, the issue for us is to, is to begin to force the organizations to prepare a better welcome. And I think that that process is in place. I, mm -hmm. I, I, uh, in the mass, joint math meetings in Baltimore in earlier this year, for the first time in the, in the program, there were... There were two sessions in the joint math meetings in Baltimore, which focused on African Americans and 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 their achievements. So I think there is slowly a kind of welcome, uh, a, a more warm welcome from the broader mathematical community, and 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 there is, I think, in 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 many places, certainly, you know, folks who I interact with from the American Mathematical Society and the Mathematical Association of America, I think that these organizations are genuinely committed at this point in time to moving that ball forward. The question of how that evolves is, is then a function of, you know, the role that we play in shaping what emerges. I mean, one of the, one of the big, big, uh, one of the big, I mean, there's still many blind spots. So one of the, one of the, big points of conversation while we were in Baltimore had to do with the fact that the Baltimore newspaper kind of mentioned that there was this big meeting of mathematicians in Baltimore in early January. And all of the, there was not, the photos that went with this article in the paper did not reflect any, 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 any African Americans or black folks. And so this was certainly a sore point for, for, for many of us gathered. But, but that is, Part of what I part of what I want to say, I, I don't want to seem, I don't want to seem despondent about that. The point is, I understand that these folks have to, uh, these it will take time uh, for the American Mathematical Society, for math departments across the United States, to all recognize that it's important for them to have, but we don't have to wait for them. Mm -hmm. We can go ahead and kind of break the door down if it's necessary and not to break the door down but to i, I think that's also a, a wrong metaphor but to sort of to do to do the things that we need to do in order to position ourselves to use mathematical tools in the interest that we define as interest for ourselves for our families for our communities etc i i want to try something for the next um four or five minutes that we have uh, I, I want already that time Exactly. That's what happens. You know, the one and a half hours seems like a long time, but then the time creeps, sneaks up on you. I'm going to ask you two questions and then we're going to go to like a rapid fire section where you'll answer as quick as possible. But these two questions, um, the first one is, why don't most of us, what, does, what don't most of us get about mathematics that perhaps you would not have gotten if you weren't a mathematician? Uh, but it requires work. It requires work, just in the same way that that it requires work to. It, it's a language, just like the language of English, just like the language of French. It has a grammar, it has a syntax. It requires work, and so and so. You know, I spend every day at the beginning of every day. This is kind of my thing. From nine to eleven, I sit down and I close the door, and and I work on math. And so so it's not some special thing that you come to the world with it requires work and if you work at it you become better at it and i think that that's the 
Yeah, so, so, so there's no math gene. Uh, right. At least as, as far as I understand, there's no math gene. I mean, some people might be more, might be predisposed, but, you know, there's no requirement for being able to do it in, in 30 seconds. You can take... <laughs> You can take three minutes to do it, and I, and I think that that's what many people don't understand. That, with, you know, my my one of my mentors used to say, with enough time, with enough motivation, and with enough help, pretty much anyone can do it. And and I think that that's what's often missing in in the, in that in that communication. Well, let's let's go to the rapid fire section as 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 quick as possible. Um, well. This might not, might be unfair to to answer quickly, but what is it really like being a mathematician? I, it's a good job. I, good. I, I like it a lot. I mean, okay. I get to, like I said. I mean, I, I get to I get to make my living by thinking about things. Uh, it's it's the best thing that I can do. I mean, I I, I wake up every day thinking, you know, I've been, <laughs> you know, I've been blessed. Well, let me ask you this now that you said that. When are you most happy? Uh, when I'm doing math and it's, it's, when I, when I, when I, when I figured out something that it's taken me a long time to figure out, <laughs> when I finally get that moment, when I, when it, when it, ah, I get it. If and, you had to do it again, will you choose mathematics? Uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely choose this again. What message do you have for African American students and parents listening tonight? Uh, time, motivation, and help. Anyone can do math. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are you no, most proud no of? Gene. It requires work. Work. What are you most proud of? Uh, children, I suppose. Being being at the birth of the children. I think <laughs> I think that's uh, yeah. That's that's yeah. I, I'm I'm most proud of. Is this your dream profession? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Um, what do you do on your days off? I, I, I very rarely have a day off. I oh. mean, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm always working. You know, mm. so, yeah, but when I'm table tennis, so on Sunday, oh, I play okay. table tennis. Yeah. Okay. What, what, is, what is gratifying about being Terrence Blackman? You know, I just, I just feel blessed. I mean, I feel like I'm part of like a, you know, we talked, we started with my mother and my father and, mm. you know, I feel like I'm part of a, you know, I feel like I'm part of this beautiful thing that sort of come to me and and you know i've you know every day i feel sort of i, I feel very happy about about that you know that i've that i've not screwed it up completely, okay right yeah <laughs> finish the sentence off i look forward to sunday evenings to uh masterpiece theater <laughs> <laughs> if master oh okay okay <laughs> if you could go back in time yeah. what would you tell that 15 year old boy uh, yeah, sort of, you know, don't drink so much. <laughs> what, what profession other than yours would you like to attempt? Uh, well, the two things I wanted to be, but I, but I, so you need a pilot or an architect. I think an architect was the thing that I, that I wanted, but, uh, you know, I didn't, I, I have some friends who were much better than me at, the, at technical drawing and I decided that's probably not my thing. What kind of conversation did you have about education with your children when they were young? Yeah, I've had an ongoing conversation about okay. it being important. Yeah, mm -hmm. an ongoing conversation. I still have it every day, I suppose. Before I ask you the last qu the last question, which I ask all my guests, they're, they're, I, I missed this question in the chat room. John asked, "Is this the Terrence Blackman who wants who went to Brooklyn College and is member of a nonprofit association?" Uh, yes, yes. This is the same. This is the same guy who went to Brooklyn College. And sorry, I said one more, two more. Do you still want to be a writer? Ah, uh, yes. That's I, I write every day. <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> yeah, what what right. kind? What kind of? What kind of book would you want to write? <laughs> but I have. Uh, I you know I just I just took down a template for a book proposal and uh, <laughs> you know I'm I'm gonna write. Okay, okay. <laughs> and this is the last question. What makes you laugh out loud? Ah, uh, so you know, everything and anything. You know, it just depends on the mood, the moment. You know, you know things that things that are things that are funny to me. You know, uh, mm -hmm. but they don't have to be funny in the yuck yuck sense. They right. just have to be funny in the yeah in the normal sense. Well, I, I it has come to a close and. 
as you notice, the time just snuck up on us. But I want to say to you, Terrence, thank you so very much for taking the time out to spend this time with us and share your journey. Uh, you were candid and, you know, we learned a lot. I felt your passion. I'm sure the audience did about the importance of education in our community. I'm sure that your message got across. Not just the importance, but the importance of participation. I especially like the the story you used with the the janitor, and 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 how he stepped in selflessly, so that it gave you the opportunity to do what you needed to do to make that a success. And when I heard that, it reminds me of how important it is for us to step beyond ourselves and and to give, to give beyond ourselves because. When we serve and we serve others, we we help not only ourselves but we help our own our whole community. And so, so thank you for sharing that particular anecdote, and thank you for sharing your time with us. Patrick in the chat room said, "Great conversation." Well, thank you very much. I, I, I again, I, I appreciated the opportunity to tell the story. And he also yeah. said, "Invite him back." So <laughs> I, I, I have to say this live. I, I do have to say this, Terence. Now that you are form, formal member of CWS, I'm inviting you to come back at some point well, so we can. I will be back at any time that you that you that you invite me. Like I said, I, I think that uh, you know this 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 business that you do of, of excavating and and curating are kind of you know or consciousness so to speak right mm -hmm. so these these conversations in some sense are kind of like a microcosm of our consciousness and and that you step forward and 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 and, and taking up this role of kind of curating this consciousness I'm, I'm i'm deeply appreciative of the of the opportunity and uh you know anytime you want me to be back i will i will most definitely uh be happy to do it and i i thank you and uh, uh thank the members of, of 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 your audience and uh i hope that i you know, I, I provided some small light, but, uh, you know, just thank for the opportunity. Oh, you're, you're welcome, sir. You are you are truly, truly welcome. And thank you. Thank you. And have a very good night. You do the same, thanks. <laughs> okay.